and they're into the stretch and here she comes songbirds got a four length lead as they come into the final furlong mike smith just shakes the reins at songbird going for broke has made progress up into second inside a family tree but they're six lengths behind songbird at the 16th pole it is songbird this magnificent filly winning the alabama she is a perfect 10. this is saratoga track and ultra larry colmas and you're listening to the paddock pass on 104.5 the team One zero four five the team one zero four five the team dot com. Proud to be joined on the phone by NBC's Lafitte Pinkai. He'll be lucky enough to join us next week on the Vac and Wolf to cover not only the winner of the Travers but next week's Woodward as well. Lafitte, I appreciate you taking some time. How are you? I'm doing well, Brian. How are you? Great to be on the show. Oh, I'm doing great, man. Another great week. Of course, it's Travers Week, and we're getting ready for one of the deepest and best races in this whole year. So before we get to that, Lafitte, let's look back to last weekend. California Chrome wins the TVG Pacific Classic, and the way he won it, I think, was just amazing. Does that performance solidify him as the best horse in the country? If Horse of the Year was to be voted on tomorrow... Yeah, California Chrome would be your 2016 Horse of the Year. Right now, he is the top-ranked race horse in the world. Um, if the Breeders' Cup Classic were this week, he would be the favorite. But there's a lot of racing still to be tended to, winding down the summer, looking ahead to the fall, and, of course, with the Breeders' Cup Classic being in his backyard, which is a, a huge advantage. And when you consider... What he has had to go through throughout the course of his career, his three-year-old season winning the Derby, the Preakness, running fourth in the Belmont Stakes. But that was a fiasco last year, just completely mismanaged and a circus. And the credit that you have to give Arch Sherman and the California Chrome himself, that once he was returned to where he should have been in the first place and been at Los Alamitos the entire time, Arch Sherman said when, when he saw him in, in, in Europe, he was, he was skin and bones. Mm. He wasn't right. It's really disappointing we didn't have a chance to see California Chrome and American Pharaoh in the Breeders' Cup Classic last year. But now that he's back home where he belongs, and Art Sherman is doing his thing with Chrome, he's thriving. And, and again, having gone through all of that last year, and for him to still be this good, this effective, this brilliant, it's five, it, it speaks volumes about how tremendous of a racehorse we're dealing with here in, in California Chrome. Well, I know that last week, and especially after we had the Whitney run here at Saratoga, a lot of the East Coasters were talking about Frosted <laughs> being in that same level. And I remember I asked Todd Shrupp from TVG, and it was definitely an East Coast, West Coast thing. I think with this performance, and I think you'd agree with me, Lafitte, he jumps way past Frosted after that performance this weekend. Even, look, Frosted, it, and, and it, what a story he's been, living in the shadow of American Pharaoh of his three-year-old season. I think he faced American Pharaoh four times. He finished behind him four times. It might have been three times, not sure. <laughs> um, but when horses get drilled time and time again, the way Frosted did by American Pharaoh, in many cases they they raise the white flag, and, and they sort of they lose that, that will to, to fight. And Frosted is better as a four-year-old now than he ever has been. His Met Mile was historic from a time standpoint, from a margin of victory standpoint. His Whitney was awesome, showing a new dimension, showing that speed right on top of the pace, and they were blistering early, and he still draws away from the field. But I tend to, to, to lean towards performances on the biggest stages and, and head-to-head performances. Now, what happened last year doesn't matter. Mm. You're talking about California Chrome and you're talking about Frosted. But they did meet once this year, and California Chrome tied Frosted to a pole and drilled him in the Dubai <laughs> World Cup. And, and the beauty of it, and then, you know, where were we all those years without the Breeders' Cup of it before? It was initiated in 1984. Now we have a, a, a testing ground, a, a proving ground where champions have to go out and earn it. And, and if everything goes well between now and the first weekend in November, you will see California Chrome and Frosted in the same starting gate and all this debate. It doesn't matter because they'll decide it on the racetrack for a Breeders' Cup Classic with a $6 million purse now and with Horse of the Year honors on the line most likely. Absolutely. Lafitte Pinkai joining us from NBC. You can follow him on Twitter at Lafitte Pinkai TV. Now, Lafitte, we go from the West Coast back to the big race on the East Coast this past weekend. Songbird wins the Alabama in impressive fashion. 
I've been saying this since March. I believe she's the best three-year-old in the country, not just three-year-old Philly. What do you believe about that? Well, Mike Smith told me he felt she was the best three-year-old he had ever written. Now, it was a quick exchange, and, and it's not as if we went through the history books and, and remembering that Mike Smith has written horses you know, like, like Holy Bull, one mm-hmm. of the most celebrated three-year-olds in the horse of the year back in, in 1994. Um, maybe it was, it was a reference to some of the more recent three-year-olds he's ever written. Maybe it was three-year-old Philly. Mm-hmm. But the point is, he lights up when he talks about Songbird. And when you watch what she's capable of doing in terms of that, that early speed how quick she is out of the starting gate, that high cruising speed. If you try and tackle her early, she's going to run you into the ground. And if you let her go, you're never going to see her again. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, 10 for 10, piling up grade one wins. She's already a Breeders' Cup champion. She's already a a, a, a two-year-old Philly reigning champion. And with, with the holder, not quite as dominant at this time of the year. As she was last year, remember, right now, this time last year, Beholder was coming off that monster effort when she won the Pacific Classic. Uh, she's, she's been humbled a little bit, and that's two straight losses for Beholder. That doesn't mean Beholder's not Beholder anymore. It just means that most likely we'll see her in the Breeders' Cup this staff. And that head-to-head matchup between Songbird and, and, and Beholder in the Breeders' Cup this staff would be one of the most anticipated events of the entire Breeders' Cup program. And, it, look, it, it's too early to start comparing her you know, to, to the ruffians of the world and the yeah. Rachel Alexanders in the world. That's not fair to their legacy. That's not fair to Songbird, period. This is still a work in progress. Let's take a step back until we reserve judgment, until we have a complete career to look at with Songbird and really enjoy what we're having the opportunity to see here, which truly is, is greatness in this undefeated feeling. And it's funny you mentioned that, Lafitte, especially now because of this year with Rachel Alexandra and Zenyatta going into the Hall of Fame. There's been a lot of those talks, seeing Songbird here twice at Saratoga, about their legacies and how she's solidified, at least up to her three-year-old credential, that she's one of the best fillies ever. Now, the question's going to be when she faces older horses, like you mentioned, Beholder in the distaff. I I think that's going to be one of the best and most anticipated races of the year. I can put you on the spot now. Obviously, with their forms now, is there any way that Beholder can beat Songbird? Richard Mandela in the Breeders' Cup at Santa Anita. I'm not betting against him. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just not. It's, it's a completely different set of circumstances. He doesn't lose, essentially. The guys won seven or eight Breeders' Cup races, all, every one of them, at Santa Anita. Mm-hmm. And Beholder, this is the, the only mayor in history to have won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies and the Breeders' Cup this staff. If there is something to be figured out regarding Beholder to get her back on top of her fastball, Richard Mandela will figure it out. And uh, there's, a, there's a big difference. Even though you're talking about the three-year-old Phillies at the very end of their season, she's about to turn four. It'll, it'll depend. Right now, if the race was tomorrow, I'd be in Songbird's corner. Mm-hmm. But being that there's still some time between now and then for Mandela to really right the ship with Beholder. And, and, and again, there's no... I mean, she got beat by California Chrome, who mm-hmm. ran off the TV screen in the Pacific Classic. No shame there. Uh, again, I don't think she's as good right now as she was last year, because that's two straight losses. But leading up to the Breeders' Cup, and we'll watch and see how she trains back on her home track. The good news is she doesn't have to travel. She doesn't have to ship because she doesn't ship well. It'll be at the If Songbird were to ever to be vulnerable, it would be at the end of a long taxing season with all the traveling her next stop is going to be in philadelphia i believe for the cotillion mm-hmm. and we'll we'll see it would be a, a clash of, of titans so to speak and 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 certainly a, a one of the highlights of this upcoming readers cup all right lafitte we'll move back to the home base at least for my home base i'm from mechanicville as is trainer chad brown who won his thousandth career race yesterday in the john's call with mr maybe my question to you, Lafitte, is has he solidified himself as one of the top five trainers in the world right now? In the world. Certainly in North America. In the world, I'd probably have to do some real digging statistically. Okay. Um, whether it's if you're looking at this year's statistics or in the last five years. What, what I do know is that it's, it's terrifying. I think if I, were, if I were a trainer, considering what Brown has already accomplished, how loaded his stable already is. He's not yet 40 years old. Mm-hmm. Most trainers, great trainers, Hall of Fame trainers, 
don't experience this kind of success until later on in their career. This is ridiculous what Chad Brown is doing at such a young age. And I don't know that any of us should be surprised, considering how closely he worked with Bobby Frankel, sure. which how much success he had and how much he clearly learned in applying many of those traits to his training now, learning from what, what many consider to be one of, if not the greatest trainers of all time. He's certainly in that conversation as Bobby Frankel. But for him to win his, his thousandth race, this close to where he was born, you know it has to be that much more special being from Mechanicville, your hometown in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, to do so at Saratoga has to be it has to be that much more special. And uh, his barn is 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 only going to get deeper. The the clients are going to continue to pile up and wait in line to have Chad Brown calling the signals for their horses. And um, it's it's remarkable how much damage he's done in such a short, relatively speaking, short period of time. Well, we found it only fitting Lafitte that he wins a stakes race at Saratoga on the turf to get his style in the career victory, which he's one of the best turf trainers in the country, moving up and adding to his resume as we go. But as we speak of trainer Chad Brown, he's going to have three running in the Travers this weekend. But the race prior is the Sword Dancer, and in my opinion, he has the best turf horse in the world in Flintshire. Is there any way that Flintshire loses this race? To me, anyhow, the, the mortal lock of the meat. He is so incredibly talented, a globe trotter, well-traveled, who's already been $8.2 million he has earned. And, and the only challenge, while campaigning him certainly overseas, was finding, finding firm ground, which was interesting for Flincher last year. He ran in the sword dancer. He, he made a mockery of the race. And he was here, a horse traveling to North America, to prep for the Arc de Triomphe. Mm-hmm. Now he's in Chad Brown's stable. I don't think you're still going to have to worry about soft ground from time to time, but not this weekend. And I'm 99 percent sure they're not going to have to worry about soft ground come Breeders' Cup weekend. If in fact those are the plans for him to run back in the Breeders' Cup turf this fall, he was second to main sequence two years ago. He didn't run in last year's Breeders' Cup, but what an exceptional racehorse! And and this is one of those races you sit back, Brian, and you say to you, you're not worried about betting. You're not worried about beating the favorite. It's not, okay, how do we make money in this race? You sit back and enjoy the, the, the superstar that is Flincher. Yeah, I was lucky enough to see him down on Belmont Day and then lucky enough to watch him again when he ran earlier in the meet when he just toyed with a, a four-horse field and won that race. But now, Lafitte, the, the race after the Travers is going to be the Boston Spa where we're going to see Lady Eli return. Now, Chad seems a little skeptical, even though he keeps saying how, you know, working really well and pointing towards this race. Are you skeptical at all? It, it, can she be a single on any tickets for pick threes and pick fours, or should I spread in this race? I mean, she's even money on the morning line, and she hasn't raced since the 4th of July of, of, of last year. It's a lot to ask, and this Boston Spa has come up salty, some top class. Mares in the field, and and while sure from a sentimental standpoint, she is the the sentimental favorite on the program of this Travers Card at, at Saratoga. But with Miss Temple City in there for Grand Motion and some of the others, just just on on paper, there are fillies and mares in there that are going to are much sharper that have a lot more recency who are going to take a tour as best as they possibly can. But just the same win loser draw. This might be the, the story of the racing year so far in 2016. When you consider how brilliant Lady Eli was, a Breeders' Cup Juvenile Philly Turf champion, um, undefeated when she went to the sideline. She won that Belmont Oaks. She wasn't back in the winner's circle yet. And Chad Brown says, quote, this is the best turf horse I've ever trained. It's from Chad Brown, who we were just discussing. The best <laughs> turf horse I've ever trained. And an hour later, she steps on a nail. <sighs> just, it, it, impossible. And she develops laminitis, and the first thing that comes to mind when you think of, of laminitis is, is Barbaro. Mm-hmm. And forget about her racing career, she was fighting for her life. And the fact that she was able to overcome the disease, you know, the, the, it, it sounds cliche, but true. It's, she, it's, it's playing the, the heart of a champion. And now she's back in training, and now she's even muddy in the Boston Spa on Travers Day at Saratoga. It's, it's perfect. And uh, I think that aside from all the, with all the grade one activity that will be taking place on that afternoon, this is a, only a, a grade two 
Last year when they ran the Boston Spa, I don't think anybody cared. Everybody was still in kind of a daze because of what had just been witnessed in terms mm-hmm. of American Pharaoh being upset and defeated by Keen Ice and the Travers. This year, this will be the it, this will be the sort of the perfect ending to what looks like a stellar day of racing. And again, it doesn't matter what she does on the track. The fact that she is back, and if she wins, there won't be there won't be a dry a dry eye in the grandstand. Lafitte Pinkai of NBC. You can follow him on Twitter at Lafitte Pinkai TV. All right, Lafitte, let's get down to business here. The Travers has its deepest field in almost 40 years. The Preakness winner, Exaggerator, is your 3-1 to one favorite. I have my pick, but how do you see the race playing out, and who do you believe the winner is? For Exaggerator, it's an opportunity to silence the critics that are out there. Very quick to point out that when he wins, he needs a certain set of circumstances. He needs a wet track. He needs a hot pace. He needs Nyquist buried down along the inside. And the Haskell Invitational, it was. It looked like a carbon copy of of the Preakness Stakes. But aside from that, you have to remember, you know, he ran pretty well in the Kentucky Derby, too. And he finished a very good second to Nyquist. Um, with 14 horses, the Storm will take him back off the pace. There should be enough pace for him to run at. You wonder about his if he's going to be at his best on this particular surface. He's worked a couple of times uh, at Saratoga, and, and much like his work before the Belmont Stakes, in which raised some eyebrows, and that most were not impressed with exaggerated his work before the Belmont, and then he ran accordingly. You know, Keith DeSormo pulling the plug on the Jim Dandy, seeing that the race on paper wasn't going to shape up an exaggerator's favor, but seeing the weather forecast at, at, at Monmouth Park, and it turned out to be a brilliant move, as impressive as he won as he won the Haskell Invitational, because at this point right now, he is the leader in the three-year-old division, uh, is exaggerator. But this this one's this one's going to be tough. He's going to have to prove it at Saratoga. But he did win there last year. Mm-hmm. Exaggerator's a throwback. You look at his three-year-old campaign, traveling to Saratoga, being in Keeneland, and at the end of the season, going back to Delta Downs. It's 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 incredible how much has been asked of him, and the fact that he's still driving as as a three-year-old because it's so wide open if i was gambling i'd take a stab against him but he's he's clearly the horse to beat yeah i agree lafitte I, i'm gonna take a stab against him i'm gonna go with destin even though he's absolutely killed me in his last two races i had him in belmont when he ran second to creator i had him in the jim dandy where lauban just lulled him to sleep on the front end i'm gonna end up going with destin and hopefully i get my eight to ten to one like i did on belmont day but Lafitte, I appreciate you giving me the time, man. We love your insight. Of course, we can hassle you again on Monday when you're on with Levac and Wolf, and maybe you know give you some credit for calling out Exaggerator. Maybe he won't win on Saturday. Well, yeah, he's 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 like I said. I think like if gambling wise, I, I I would I'm gonna play I would play Gunrunner from the from the extreme outside. Okay. Um, it, it's just it's too and in many cases when you get a race like this, there's 14 horses and you say 12 or 13 can win. The favorite does wind up winning. <laughs> Yes. Just because it's a, it, he, he is the favorite in this race from a value standpoint, I'm going I'm to look elsewhere. And I, Gunrunner, I think he's much better than what we saw in the Haskell. I don't think he handled the slop, or I'm, maybe I'm just looking for an excuse. I'm going to ignore the 14 post, even though he could get caught wide a little bit. It's not a, it's not the Churchill Downs run from the gate to the first turn when you're talking about Saratoga. And, and the way Florent Giroux is going right now, I don't know that anybody's riding better than Florent Giroux in North America right now. Steve Asmussen, it just it, it, when it rains, it pours. Wins his first Belmont Stakes with Creator, inducted into the Hall of Fame. It, it, it all seems like the, the perfect storm for Steve Asmussen, and maybe he has Gunrunner sitting on tilt and ready for one of his top races. If he brings his best, I think he's good enough to win this Travers. I'm going to ignore the outside post and hope I get something close to that 10-1. to Lafitte Pinkai of NBC. Again, you can follow him on Twitter at Lafitte Pinkai TV. Lafitte, thanks for the time, man. And we'll hope we get Gunrunner. I'm going to play Gunrunner, Destin Exacta, and hope we get him home. There you go. Good luck this weekend, Brian. Thanks as always. 104.5 The Team, 104.5 The Team.com. We were lucky enough to have another guest on this week's show, the Director of Communications at the National Racing Hall of Fame, Brian Bouye, and he's here to talk about not only the Travers this weekend, but his new book that just came out, Bare Knuckles and Saratoga Racing, The Remarkable Life of John Morrissey. Brian, thank you for taking the time, man. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. So now, I was lucky enough to obtain a copy of this book, and I read it in one sitting, man. It was absolutely unbelievable. Not only did you cover his the beginning of his life, but you know, obviously the Saratoga Racing Park will draw everybody out. So it was 
a lot of information. What, what, how long did it take you to write this book? Well, I had, uh, I had done a lot of research on them in the past. I'd, I'd spent some time at the Troy Record in the Saratogian before I took my job at the museum here, and I'd written some articles on him, you know, newspapers and magazines, and I'd kind of compiled some bits and pieces over the years. And uh, at one point I realized, you know, this guy really didn't have a full biography out there, so I, I said, you know, why not take a shot at it and put it together? And, uh, you know, I started writing it, and I probably took about six or seven months of, you know, four or five nights a week really going at it. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, a book came together out of it. Absolutely. Now, Brian, a lot of people think, you know, with the big names that we have around Saratoga with the, you know, William Travers and the Canfield Casino, that all of these are kind of intertwined. But, you know, no one really knew that John Morrissey was from the city, not Saratoga, but Troy. I mean, that's that's really interesting, man. Well, that's it. I mean, his, his legacy is up here, obviously, with the racetrack and, and the History Museum, which used to be the clubhouse that he opened. But, uh, yeah, he grew up in Troy, and that's kind of where he started earning some of his initial notoriety, you know, uh, fighting gang fights on the streets and in the bars and stuff like that before he went down to New York. So, yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's a kind of a local hero down in Troy as well. So now, Brad, talk about this. As I kept reading, I realized that, you know, there was nothing really good enough for him you know, whether it was to, you know, get out of Troy and move to New York, or now we get to where he started a lot of stuff in Saratoga. What was the, in your research, did you find anything that really put him over the top that how he started, uh, you know, this historic racetrack that is Saratoga? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think the big thing about John that for people to realize is that he was kind of, you know, always had a bit of a chip on his shoulder. You know, he came from nothing. Uh, you know, an, an immigrant family. He had seven younger sisters, and the family never had much money growing up. So um, he was always fighting for everything he got. And, and I think, you know, that's kind of a reflection of his legacy. I mean, he made some money fighting, but then he got involved in the casinos. And that's kind of, you know, what led him to Saratoga. He had a, a small little casino up here before he opened the track. And, uh, you know, that was running at night. So he needed something to entertain people during the days. And, you know, that's how he brought horse racing to the town. So now he, he gets this, you know, idea of running horses as well but like you mentioned before he was in a lot of casinos and that just didn't start up here in saratoga you know he started in new york is that right that's correct he got involved when he was a younger guy in the dead rabbits which was a street gang that did uh uh, a lot of political enforcement work for, for the Tammany Hall party. And he was so good at it, and the, the party leaders recognized that they had kind of a, a superstar here, that they allowed him to have a, you know, a stake in a few casinos in the city. And eventually uh, that grew, and at one point he either owned or was in partnership in 16 different casinos in New York. So that's what really uh, you know, led to his fortune. Now, Brian, this is one of the, the better Saratoga books that I've read, and that I give you a ton of credit for doing all the research that you did, because you didn't only go to... You know, stuff from you said you were at the Troy Record and stuff you could find being at the National Museum of Racing Hall of Fame, but you had to go elsewhere. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I went out to Canastota, the uh, the Boxing Hall of Fame out there, and uh, got some interesting information, and I uh, got a lot of stuff through the Library of Congress. Um, you know, there's a lot of good records out there about him. I mean, he was so heavily covered in the newspapers of the era. Uh, when he died, he was the front page story in the New York Times and all those papers. Uh, the New York Times obit was seven columns on the guy, so it tells you, you know, what what a uh, a big name he was back in that era. So now, right, I was lucky enough to get a copy of the book, and I recommend it to all the listeners to go out and get this. But where can they go and get this book? Uh, pretty much anywhere in the area. I mean, all the local bookstores have it. Um, you can order it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of those places online as well. Um, I'm, I'm doing a, a speaking event tonight at, at the uh, Canfield Casino, the uh, History Museum in uh, Congress Park, at 7 p.m. So if you want to hear a little more about the story, uh, I'm going to give a little talk, and then I'll be signing copies of it after at 7 o'clock tonight. So I recommend everyone go out there. It's Canfield Casino in Congress Park tonight at 7 p.m. Meet up with Bry, get his wonderful insight into this book, and, of course, get a copy of it and a signed copy because they're going to be going quick. Now, Brian... You've been around racing for a while, obviously, being at the National Museum of Racing Hall of Fame. So this this weekend shouldn't be a surprise to you that it's one of the bigger weekends going. One of the bigger stories is obviously Chad Brown yesterday getting 1,000 wins. How big a deal is that you know, for the area because of him being so close to Saratoga? I think it's huge. I mean, I, I remember Chad when he... Uh 
uh, you know, first went out on his own, and, and he comes to Saratoga, and he wins the first race uh, on the first day. I think this was going back about seven years ago, and, you know, people didn't really know much about him other than, you know, here's this local guy. He used to be an assistant to Bobby Frankel. You know, kind of what's, what's the path for glory going to be to this guy? And, you know, he wins a Breeders' Cup race with, with Maram and, and just takes off from there. I mean, um, you, you know, I think he's an absolutely huge story in this area, and, and to have a 1,000 wins this early in his career, and um, I don't think there's a better turf trainer in America, and he's obviously, you know, taking that and expanding it to the, to the dirt as well. But, you know, he's got some of the best owners in the sport backing him, and he's just such a smart guy the way he places horses and, you know, the way he gears up for the big races. I mean, uh, you know, Todd Pletcher has dominated Sarat- Saratoga for the better part of a decade, and, you know, it looks like the tide has turned here with, with Chad leading the standings this year. Now, now, Brian, we were laughing because I was there yesterday when he won the thousandth race, and we were joking because it's only fitting for him to win, you know, a turf stake at Saratoga to get his thousandth victory. That they couldn't have been staged any better than that. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that that pretty much is just the way it couldn't have been written any better. I mean, uh, you know, that's what kind of you know made his name and and everything on the turf. You know, has he's been the king of that the last few years. But um, you, you look at the Travers this weekend; he's got some entries there, and, and I think a lot of people are. You know, going to kind of dismiss him a little bit um, with some of those horses, but you know he's he's got a couple of really good shots in my opinion here. I mean, I, I think Connect is a, is a really good really good horse on the improve. Uh, Gift Box, you know, has, has shown a lot of ability, and even my man Sam has had some flashes. So, you know, here he is in the biggest race of the year, and he's got three of the entrants. So he's he's loaded for this. Yeah, Connect the Ten Horse is the second choice at four to one with your favorite Exaggerator at three to one. Now, Brian, not only does he have three shots in the Travers, which I'll get your pick here in a minute, he has one in the race before and after the Travers. We'll talk about those real quick. He's got Flinch here in the Sword Dancer. Is there any way that you see, in my opinion, Flinch here is the best turf horse going right now. Is there any way that Flinch here gets beat in this race? Something, something's got to go wrong for him to get beat. Um, you know, this is a horse that, I mean, he won this race last year. Uh, he's in top form. You know, I mean, you look at his record, um, you know, the majority of his losses are, are seconds over in Europe, which, you know, the European turf racing is far superior to American. And, you know, I would say Flincher in, in the Sword Dancer is probably the lock of the day. I mean, something's got to go wrong for him not to win this race. Uh, that horse is extremely impressive. And, and I would say that, that, that he's probably going to go off at at least one. He could be one to nine. I, I think that's what we're looking at in the sword dancer for him. Now, of course, he's got him before the Travers, but right after the Travers is kind of the, the sentimental race of the day. You know, we were talking to Lafitte Pinkai earlier about that, and he was mentioning how th- this, this horse and Lady Eli over, overcoming everything would be only fitting to see her win again for Chad right after the Travers. It could be three in a row for Chad after you it, know, that really race. It really could. And the thing about Lady Eli is, you know, I'm telling people who are asking me if, if I'm going to Travers, I'm thinking, yeah, I'll absolutely be there. But don't leave after the Travers. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a great race after. And uh, Lady Eli is just a fantastic story. I mean, I've been following her since her you know, Breeders' Cup win a couple of years ago. And um, she has been absolutely fantastic. And, and what she's overcome, uh, you know, after stepping on that nail and battling laminitis is just, just remarkable. And, um, you know, if she pulls this off, it's it's going to be just a tremendous victory because he's not putting her in an easy spot. I mean, this is a tough race to come back for the first one out, but they've they've taken their time with her, and Chad has been very thorough about, you know, we're not going to run her unless she's 100% ready. And uh, her works have been impressive, and it's just definitely the sort of story you can absolutely root for. We're talking to Brian Bouye, the Director of Communications at the National Racing Hall of Fame. Now, Brian, the, the signature race of the meet end of Saturday, of course, is the Travers. Chad, we've already discussed, has three. Exaggerator's your favorite. I'm on the Destin train, even though he's broken my heart, both in the Belmont and in the Jim Dandy. I still can't, you know, get off of him at 10-1. to 1. How do you see this race playing out, and who is your selection? Well, I mean, it's, it's pretty unique. It tells you how vulnerable people think the favorite is when you've got 14 horses. It's the first time we've had a full field in the Traverse since 1977. So, um, so Exaggerator isn't exactly scaring anybody off, but... You know he's a proven horse. Um, you know, and I think he's he's worthy of that three to one. But the, the skepticism is that you know the majority of his big wins have been on the off tracks. And uh, you know it looks like the weather's going to be good for Saturday, so he's going to have to prove it. And I can see why a lot of people think he's vulnerable. Um, I do like what you're saying about Destin. I, I think he, uh, you know, if you can get him in that range of you know ten to one or twelve to one on the odds, I think it's a good play. Um, you know, this is a horse that ran pretty decent in the Kentucky Derby off basically a two month layoff from Tampa. So. Um, you know he's been there. He's he's uh, you know he was a step away from winning the Belmont. 
Um, he was an okay third in the Jim Dandy. I, I thought everybody let Lauban out there too early on the lead, but uh, Destin's going to be a factor. Um, you know, I know Bob Baffert. Uh, you know, thought he was winning this race last year, obviously, but the two that he's sending out. Uh, Arrowgate and American Freedom are both very interesting as well. Um, my pick in the race is American Freedom. I think he's a, a horse on the improve. He uh, ran a really nice race in the Haskell the last time out, and uh, you know he's got Rafael Bayerano coming in, who I think is as good as any rider in the country. Absolutely. Now there's your selection for Brian Bouye. Make sure you check out his book, Bare Knuckles and Saratoga Racing, The Remarkable Life of John Morrissey. You can go to the Canfield Casino tonight, 7 o'clock. He'll be talking about the book, giving out copies, of course, and signing them. Brian, I appreciate you giving me the time, and best of luck this weekend, man. Anytime. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot.